So I'm here to talk about uh, TV that talks back. Um, but before I tell you guys about Twitch and what we're doing and uh, some of the cool things we're learning right now, uh, I want to take you back to before Twitch um, when I was with these three guys. And we just graduated from college and we were starting our first company and we had this idea that we really should make a reality television show about Justin's life. Justin was my good friend growing up, we went to college together. He's a pretty interesting guy. Uh, and we thought, you know, what would be really amazing uh, is we have these cool conversations, we have these interesting things that happen. We should produce a live uh, reality TV show. It's technically possible now. It's really easy. Webcams are available. Uh, EVDO cards are available. I don't know if you guys remember EVDO cards, but they were the very first uh, internet in a box that you could just sort of carry with you on a USB stick. And so we did. We started the Justin TV show. Uh, that's a picture of Justin wearing his hat cam. and. Uh, wearing the backpack that had hot swappable batteries to enable the show to run 24 hours a day uh, without ever having a break because we could just swap the batteries in and out and the camera could keep rolling. Uh, this turned out to be a colossally terrible idea. Uh, there's almost, I can't, it's hard to explain the number of ways in which this idea was bad. First of all, reality television is driven by editing. Uh, if, I, I presume a lot of people here actually know more than I do about reality TV, but one of my main learnings was that you really, really, really have to edit down uh, weeks of content in order to get uh, hours of content. We had an hour of content per hour of viewership, which meant it was really boring. Um, and worse, we didn't really know anything about making entertainment at all. We'd spent the past, you know, six years learning how to make websites really well, learning how to scale technology, uh, and we weren't entertainers, um, and we were not that interesting. Uh, so we then took the platform that we'd built to enable Justin to do this, and we'd gotten all this inbound demand from other people who said, I want to be like Justin, I want to stream my life. And so we opened up the platform to, uh, to anyone. We let anyone start broadcasting using the technology we'd built for the Justin TV show. And this was much more successful. It turns out we are pretty good technologists and pretty bad uh, entertainers, and the viewership we got from letting anyone use the platform far exceeded anything we managed to achieve uh, using our own show individually. Um, and that we got a ton of growth there because we'd built this thing to scratch our own itch, and it had turned out a lot of people shared that itch. Um, but then something bad happened, um, which is we stopped growing. <laughs> that's, the, uh, that's the trough of sorrow. Uh, we, we'd grown for quite a while, uh, but we didn't really understand why we were growing other than we'd built this cool thing, uh, we really liked it, we thought it was cool, and when we let other people use it, it grew and grew and grew until it didn't. And then we spent a couple years trying to figure out what to do. You'll notice if you can see the, I don't know if you can read the year markers on that graph, uh, but we stopped growing right around when the 2008 crash happened and you could no longer raise money, which was a bad time to stop growing. Uh, so we decided to spend the next couple years, instead of trying to grow, trying to get to break even. And we did, we got to break even. Uh, we stopped hemorrhaging money, uh, so we now had this nice, stable 20-person company uh, that could persist. And we were trying to figure out what to do next, and that launched Project Zarth. Um, Zarth was a domain name that we picked up because the script that one of our employees had written to find word-like domain names picked it out for us. Um, and this internal uh, project was an attempt to figure out how do we take the Justin TV platform and get growth going again? Um, because clearly we'd lost our growth mojo. Uh, we had two big ideas. One of them was mobile, and that wound up getting spun off as social cam and was, went on to actually be somewhat successful. Um, and the other one was gaming. Um, I'd been a gamer my whole life, and the only content on Justin TV that I actually liked, the only stuff I actually personally watched, was the video game content. Uh, at this time, uh, StarCraft II beta was really big on Twitch, and I was playing the StarCraft II beta, and I was just really amped about it. And I really thought there was something there. And I did some business justifications as to why, but that's not really why we chose gaming. I was excited about gaming because it was something I personally was interested in. And that led to Twitch. So we spent about six months working on Justin TV Gaming uh, and getting quite good results before realizing we needed a new brand. And we relaunched uh, that brand as Twitch in 2011. And that new brand was really about saying, hey, we're here to be a platform for gamers. Uh, we're here to be not just any other video live streaming platform, but something that's going to be hyper-specialized around live streaming gaming. Uh, and that turned out to be a really big deal because there was apparently a bunch of people waiting for someone to come out and offer that platform to them. 
there was a huge strategic shift that happened between Justin TV and Twitch, and it wasn't actually the gaming thing. Uh, the gaming thing was important. That's the surface level thing about what was different about Twitch. But the bigger strategic shift was we became focused on creators above anything else. Justin TV, we'd always had this internal tug of war between the viewer and the broadcaster. Uh, because obviously you need both, right? It's how can you choose as a platform between the viewers who come to your platform to watch and the broadcasters who come to your platform to create and to share. Uh, but for Twitch, we came down on the side of the creators because of two fundamental strategic reasons. The first was that there was a lot fewer of them. <laughs> there are actually not that many people who can produce great content. And so we were capable of going and talking to almost everyone making great gaming content. Like we could literally just get on the phone with all of them. That was very attractive because it meant if we focused on them, we really could learn their needs on an individual basis. And the other thing is that as a viewer, you wind up using lots of entertainment platforms. Um, I don't know about you, but I watch content on HBO Now. I watch content on YouTube. I watch content on Twitch, obviously. I watch content on Hulu. Like I use almost every platform out there. I even occasionally watch cable these days. And uh, as a content creator, though, you wind up being, especially as a smaller content creator, kind of putting your bets on a single platform. And we realized that that meant it was incumbent on us to really serve those creators and focus on them. So what kind of creators did we get? Twitch has all kinds of gaming creators. We've got tournaments people running giant, uh, now very giant, uh, sports leagues effectively around games as sports. We have entertainers who come on who are just funny, just engaging people who talk to an audience or who uh, tell jokes, tell stories, and everyone wants to be their friend. We have news. I don't know if you've seen our E3 coverage, but it's excellent this year. If you want to know what, everything that's going on in gaming, I heartily suggest twitch.tv slash event slash E3. Uh, we have really awesome coverage this year. We've got educators, you have people who t teach people how to play games better. We also have people who do a lot of life coaching. There's a surprising amount of how do I improve my life educational content on Twitch around using video games as kind of the medium for teaching that. Um, and we have talk shows. We have people with dial-in traditional talk shows, but usually about gaming. Um, and this is just the start of it. We have all these different kinds of content creators. It's, it's easy to think of Twitch as being esports, um, and we're very publicly identified with that. And don't get me wrong, I love esports. but we actually found that the platform is a lot more than that. It's a whole breadth of different kinds of content. So what did these creators want? Um, I did probably 40 interviews at, as we were starting Twitch, and we've continued to do more and more over time. And it really boils down to three things. Creators want money. Um, this is obviously important. Uh, it's surprisingly easy to overlook, though, how many online platforms that are de utterly dependent on creators have no way for that creator to make money. I think most of them, actually. Justin TV didn't. Uh, and this has turned out to be huge. If you want people to be able to make a living on your platform creating content, you better find a way to get them money. So second thing people want is fame. Um, I think everyone here probably knows about that, but fame is almost a combination of two things. It's both money tomorrow. If you're famous today, you can leverage that into more money tomorrow, but it's also just something people intrinsically want. They want to get their content out to a huge number of people. It's very important to be able, if you have a choice between two platforms, and you'll make 10% more money over here, but you'll reach five times as many people uh, over there, you're going to pick the five times as many people. I know there's obviously a trade-off there, but people actually really do care about getting their content out into the world, independent of whether it makes them the most money or not. And finally, people want love. In the immortal words of Holloway, what is love? Uh, so, love is this incredibly important part of what the Twitch platform brings to our broadcasters. Money and fame are obvious, Every platform, I think, that's ever existed for content creators that's been successful has brought money and fame in some form. Um, we really, I think, differentiate ourselves focusing on love. And love is that positive feedback you get when you create content and you get that great reception coming in from other people who love it. When the platform supports you and you get a personal call from someone on our partnerships team telling you how much they enjoyed your last show and asking if there's anything they can do to help when you're engaging with your chat room and people are telling you about how they ch you changed their lives, right? That's, that's love. It's this feeling that you are making a difference, you're creating content that people really care about, that you are cared about, um, and that your content is loved. And that turns out to be incredibly important. We have won so many contentious deals because we couldn't offer more money, we didn't offer substantially more reach, usually more reach, but not, not enough more, um, but we could offer a platform where people just got that feeling that this is where they're accepted. Um, and that's just been 
completely transformative for our platform. And the thing that drives love on Twitch is interaction. Uh, interaction with chat. In fact, Twitch on the surface looks like a video site, but what I've learned over time is that we're not. We're a chat community. We're 10,000 chat communities. Uh, we're actually like 100,000 chat communities. And each of those individual chat communities uh, exists to connect with the broadcaster and create a forum for that broadcaster to get that love and that positive feedback that they need. And then incidentally, that drives a whole lot of viewership that, al that also happens at the same time. People show up for the video, but they really stay because of the chat. Um, you can see how much they stay, 850% longer uh, for people who chat than people who don't. So that, that chat engagement is really what keeps the viewers around, but it's also what keeps the broadcasters around. As you broadcast, if you're getting people chatting on your channel, if you're getting that positive feedback, you broadcast 760% longer than someone who doesn't. That's a huge difference. Uh, it basically is a difference between having a channel that's fun to broadcast on and one that isn't. Uh, I broadcast every Fridays. Uh, you should check out my channel, twitch.tv slash Sarbandia. Uh, and I have been shocked at how much of a difference it makes when I have a chat room that's really engaged and exciting than a chat room that's sort of dead or, or uninteresting. It makes broadcasting go from a chore to something that's actually fun to do. And I think it's hard to overestimate how important that love aspect is for driving people to keep broadcasting and staying on the platform. And I think that's a, maybe a lesson for us uh, about content creators in general. Finally, we even monetize through interaction. Uh, we sell subscriptions, but they're not content subscriptions. Uh, we don't paywall anything. Anyone can watch all the content for free, pretty much. But what you can't do is you can't get the broadcaster's attention um, and interaction with these micro-celebrities, or increasingly macro-celebrities, not just micro-celebrities, without uh, paying your $5 a month. And it's not just that you're paying for the interaction, you're also showing your support. I think that's an equally important part of it. You're showing your love for that broadcaster by being part of their fan club, by subscribing to their channel for $5 a month. It's been an exceptionally powerful tool for us for helping co content creators monetize. And again, driven by monetization. Driven, all the features for our subscriptions are driven through chat, not through the video stream, um, which I think is a, a huge learning for us. We always thought everything would be about the video. So relevant to people here, Twitch viewership is a lot like TV. Um, the average person watches, who watches Twitch watches 86 minutes per day. Uh, and that's obviously the average. You have a bunch of people who come by for a couple minutes, which means the people who are actually engaging, who are actually sticking around, are watching hours and hours of video every day. And uh, it's appointment viewing. People broadcast on regular schedules, and other people show up to watch them live when they're broadcasting. It's very much like a traditional uh, TV outlet in that way, except instead of tens or hundreds of channels, we've got 25,000 on in a given time, but the core linear uh, surf around, see what's on, or show up for your, for your show at 5 p.m. dynamic is alive and well, and it's that same kind of long form engagement um, that you see with television. So, meet Bob. Bob Ross, uh, near and dear to anyone who lived through the 80s heart, uh, was in many ways one of the original interactive streamers in my opinion. You weren't in the room, but you kind of felt like you were when Bob was broadcasting himself painting. Um, he were painting along with him. Uh, he was helping you through that process. Uh, and we went and we got Bob Ross on Twitch. Um, I was really proud of this for our, for our channel because Twitch started branching out from gaming and we're experimenting with this new category we call creative. And creative is an opportunity for anyone who paints, who blacksmiths, who programs, who makes things to come share their creations with the world and share their creative process with the world. And since that's what Bob did best of all uh, before the internet even really existed, we thought Bob would be a great addition to, uh, to Twitch. And uh, he was. So that's, uh, that's Kappa. Uh, Kappa was an intern, but his face has become the universal face of trolling. Um, and we gave, we, he's an emoticon people use in chat a lot. Uh, and this was the Kappa Ross emote that was developed so that people could express their appreciation uh, for the Bob Ross show. It's become one of our more popular emotes. Um, and we got like 5.6 million viewers uh, watching the Bob Ross stream. 
um, just in the first week we ran the marathon. You can see there the, the chat room going nuts uh, as we were uh, shutting the stream down towards the, towards the end. And uh, it was really kind of a, a bit of an internet phenomenon. I'm a little bit uh, excited to say that I think we caused a resurgence in the popularity of Bob Ross. It's like you may have seen him in the media recently, and I, I really do credit this, uh, this broadcast with making that happen. And what was fascinating to me about the Bob Ross phenomenon was that it was so chat-driven. The Bob Ross show has been available in one way or another since it was first broadcast. It's always been something you could go get. But what changed when we broadcast it on Twitch is suddenly we had a audience and we had an interactive audience and we had these people who could be interacting with each other and creating memes. There's this great moment where every time Bob Ross would put a dark line down the middle of a, what was apparently already a perfect painting, everyone in chat would si start saying, ruined, ruined. And then, of course, Bob would turn it into a tree and the chat would say, saved, saved. Oh, good, oh, good, we're, we're safe. Um, and those little moments of interaction of community made the show 10 times as engaging as it would have been otherwise. Um, and I think really drove that audience. And now meet Julia. Uh, we went and we licensed Julia Child along with a bunch of other food content for the Food Channel, which now runs 24-7 uh, on Twitch. And we got the same dynamic. You see Julia Child's show, um, which is you know, not new content, although it does have that same sort of educational interactive feel to it. Uh, and you have this amazing chat community going around it discussing the content, and I, I wish so badly we could go back in time and give Bob Ross or give Julia Child the ability to stream on Twitch, because I would have loved to see them take questions from the audience. Uh, but it was amazing how well it worked, even without that. Um, and we achieved sort of similar numbers, similar success with, uh, with Julia Child, and we've been really excited to see all of this uh, creative content uh, start to grow and become a major part of Twitch. So we're really excited about the new content categories we're going to get to bring on top of gaming. So that brings me to my actual conclusion, the, the, my one thought that I actually want to share with you all uh, about television and the future of television and, uh, and how Twitch plays into that. Uh, you have scripted TV, you have unscripted TV, um, and I think you now have interactive TV. And what distinguishes interactive TV is that you get the love while you're making it. You actually have interaction uh, with your audience, with, the, with participants, uh, during the production itself. I think the closest thing to this on television today in some ways is like American Idol, where you have the you know, call in, but even that is on such delay, you can't really see if you personally made a difference. It doesn't have that same kind of directly uh, interactive experience. And one of the surprising things about interactive TV uh, to me, which is really what I think Twitch is, is that it scales up better than you think. You know, I, I, uh, I always knew, because the Justin TV show was like this, that it, if you had 200 people watching a channel, you could do this awesome interactive thing and talk to them and bring their feedback in. And of course that works, but it's 200 people. That's not unmanageable. Of course you can do interaction. But now we have people like Lyric who have 30,000 people watching their channel and it still works. You can still have interactive uh, content. Now you have to moderate a lot more and you have to put barriers to entry for the actual interaction and, and meter it down somehow. But still the, the show is fundamentally driven by interaction with the audience. That's still a huge part of what makes that show exciting. And so I think there's this challenge for television going forward uh, to add this third kind of content. Um, because I think that as a content creator, as personally, uh, this is some of the more exciting content. This is content that really uh, you get to be part of as part of the audience. And yes, it's not Game of Thrones. I love Game of Thrones. And Game of Thrones should not and will never be interactive television. But there's this entire category of content, like Unscripted sits right next to Scripted and it's different, but it's also really exciting uh, of interactive content. And I'm super excited with Twitch to find ways to work with uh, our user-generated streamers, who now, some of whom are getting very popular, with professionals, with uh, existing content, and figure out how to make that content interactive. Uh, one of the clever things we wound up doing with the Food Channel is letting the audience choose which show rolls next. And that sounds silly, but when we did that, it hugely improved our engagement numbers because people are really excited to get to talk about, argue for, and then vote on what show that should be next on the stream. It uh, turned out to be a really powerful mechanic for us. And I think that we're just so early discovering exactly what's going to work here, but it, 
every time we try and experiment with something where we bring the audience in and we let them really be involved in the content, we, uh, we get great results. Um, and it's been really, really cool. So that's it. That's my uh, presentation. And uh, thank you all for listening.